Thank you for coming out on this sort of blustery night. I'm Jane Lang. I'm the director of the Nina Historical Society. And this is the first in the series of our program nights that we do throughout the year. So welcome, and we're very glad you're here. I would like at this time to introduce our new assistant director, and that is Becky Heike Kwiatowski. She has just joined. Um, I'd be clapping if I could. <laughs> We're very happy that she's joined us um, as the assistant executive director, and she is an amazing asset to the organization. Um, I don't see that we have other board members present, so I won't introduce them. But I would like to draw your attention to the fact that we've got um, some lovely ladies sitting at the table from the National Historical Society and Becky at the table as well. And we've got information and handouts for you that you could collect if you're interested. Our current newsletter is there. We are also just in the beginning of our membership drive for the Nina Historical Society. So if you're a member, you may have gotten that in the mail or as an email or both, and we encourage you to continue supporting us or if you haven't joined the Historical Society and you like what we do, the projects we do, the programs, the events that we coordinate, um, please consider supporting us and supporting the Menasha Historical Society too because what we do, we do for the community, so we can't do it without your help. Um, next month, I wanted to point out that our program will be an oral history collection, and that is a great opportunity for you to come out and learn about how to collect the important stories of your family, of your friends. Um, so often we uh, wait until it's too late and say, oh, I wish I had written that down or recorded that story that mom told me, and we don't remember to do that. So this is a great um, workshop that you can attend the date is October 18th. Um, we have a workshop opportunity from 10 until 2.30 or an evening program at 7 p.m. <clears throat> um, the all-day workshop is $15. That includes lunch and that will help defray some of the costs of bringing our speaker, who is Troy Reeves, who is in charge of oral history collection for the University of Wisconsin in Madison. So please consider doing that. We'll have a sign up with Becky, or if you want to call us or email, you could do that as well. Um, I also want to just say, if you came out to the Nina Powwow this past weekend, we hope you enjoyed it. We really enjoyed it. It was our third annual Nina Menasha Intertribal Powwow, and we're always so happy when we can partner with the Menasha Historical Society on an event. We were so thrilled that Nick Jebney provided the sound for us again this year, which made it just spectacular. And here's Nick again tonight uh, recording this program for us. So thank you so much to Nick and the Menasha Historical Society uh, for your partnership with us. And I especially want to thank Kathy Helmsky for being here tonight and partnering for us on this program. This is a program that um, we I had thought about doing this relative to our current exhibit, which is Making a Hometown Life in Nina's Progressive Era. And Kathy and I talked about it, and I had done a similar presentation for the Women's Tuesday Club, and thought, you know, what would be really interesting is if we joined forces as we did for the Wisconsin Hometown Stories video, which is available on the site table if you're interested in purchasing. Um, join forces to create a program on some of the amazing women of this time period and this exciting time in our history. So thank you, Kathy, for being here and partnering for us with this program. So what we're going to do is uh, dive into the program at this point. And again, like I said, we were um, researching for the exhibit that we currently have in place, Making a Hometown. And it got us to realizing that there were so many stories of women in our community that hadn't been told. Um, the progressive era is uh, considered to be 1890 to 1920, maybe 1880 to 1920. And during that time period, so many things happened, so many um, changes were made, improvements were made, 
that we are still benefiting from today. So that was uh, kind of what got us inspired to do this presentation, and we hope that it will inspire you as well. So in researching, we discovered that Nina and Menasha's women were very active in both local and national issues of the day. And the work that women did often emphasized things like health and welfare. Those were the issues that women were drawn to address. But as far as national trends and movements, Nina and Menasha were on the leading edge um, in addressing some of these issues. Some of the women's groups in the area that were addressing social needs and issues of the day were the Visiting Nurse Association, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the Nina Menasha Emergency Society, and the Women's Tuesday Club. So again, as Nina and Menasha Historical Societies worked together on Wisconsin Hometown Stories a video project, we wanted to work on this project together. So what did the United States look like at the turn of the previous century? It's really important when you're studying history to kind of understand that context for these people's lives. What was going on? Uh, what, did the, what did the world look like in 1900? So here's some interesting statistics for 1903. The average life expectancy in the United States was 47. Only 14% of the homes in the United States had a bathtub. Only 8% of the homes had a telephone. There were only 8,000 cars in the United States and only 144 miles of paved roads. The maximum speed limit in most cities was 10 miles per hour. That's probably a good idea. More than 95% of all births took place at home. And that is a very significant uh, fact to remember. Here's kind of an interesting one. Most women only wash their hair once a month and used borax or egg yolks for shampoo. The population of Las Vegas, Nevada was 30. <laughs> Crossword puzzles, canned beer, and iced tea hadn't been invented yet. One in ten U.S. adults couldn't read or write. And only 6% of Americans had graduated from high school. So just some interesting facts to keep in mind as you learn about the stories of these women and Nina. So what were some of the problems that uh, these women were wrestling with. Uh, progressivism as a concept or as a time period in our history is really a response to industrialization. So what were we going to do with the new problems that were brought about by increasing economic inequality, immigration issues, health problems related to city dwelling and factory work, safety in factories? All of these issues were um, kind of coming about because we were moving from an agrarian society into an industrialized society. And a lot of changes were taking place that we had to wrestle with and figure out how will we address these problems. I thought this was really an interesting quote. Alice Hamilton, who was a notable Chicago progressive and physician, which is interesting in itself, uh, turn of the century, learned from her mother that there are two kinds of people. The ones who say, someone ought to do something about it, but why should it be I? And the ones who say, somebody must do something about it, then why not I? So many local women in Nina and Menasha followed the lead of women like Alice Hamilton and became the doers in our communities, focusing on helping others and making our communities better. Again, what were some of the problems these women were wrestling with at the time? Child labor was certainly one of the issues of the day. It wasn't until uh, 1938 that Congress finally approved the Fair Labor Standards Act, which specifically regulated child labor. So imagine dealing with that issue as a mother or father. 
There were multiple other social problems that seemed to be brought about um, as we moved away from an agrarian society into an industrialized society. Uh, work no longer centered in the home. We weren't farming together as families. So there were different schedules, rules. There was an increase in crime, low wages, long hours, 12 to 14 hour days were not uncommon. Here's an interesting thing to consider. After about 1850, the work of most wives was increasingly separate and distinct from that of their husbands. Prior to that, think of the family farm and that unified um, work that you're doing as a family as compared with someone leaving the home, going off to work, and just the, the challenges of that. And how would we address some of the problems that came about because of this? So getting back to the progressives, who were they? The progressives believed that the growth of industries and the growth of cities caused social problems for our society, and they wanted to do something to address these problems. We're just going to take a look um, on a larger uh, scale and look at national trends with progressivism, and then we're going to work our way down to the local people who were actually doing the work. So on a national level, some of the famous presidents who were progressive, Theodore Roosevelt was president from 1901 to 1909. He was a Republican who later created the Progressive Party. He was famous for enacting legislation to increase the power of the federal government and limit the power of big business. But he was also very interested in improving the safety of food and drugs. And he's really well known for setting aside land for national parks. Woodrow Wilson was president from 1913 to 1921. He was a Democrat who continued the trust busting that had begun with Roosevelt, and he also had a strong focus on laborers' rights. One of our famous Wisconsinites was Robert La Follette. He was an American Republican and politician who's best known as a proponent of progressivism and a fierce opponent to corporate power. He served as a member of the U.S. House of Representatives for Wisconsin. He was the governor of Wisconsin and a U.S. Senator from Wisconsin during his career. He also ran for President of the United States in 1924. At this point, I'd like to hopefully be able to show you a video clip of Bob La Follette speaking in 1924. I think it's very interesting to hear what he had to say, but also to just watch his oratory style because it's pretty interesting compared to what we see nowadays. Opportunity. 
patriotic, a patriotic duty to build at least a part of his life into the life of his country, to do his share in the making of America according to the plan of the fathers. So I thought that was kind of an interesting look back on the type of politician that was running for president in 1924. So also kind of puts you back into that time period. So now taking a look at some of the social reformers, um, women social reformers of the day that some of the women of Nino were listening to. You can see Elizabeth Cady Stanton on the left. She was born in 1815. She was an American suffragist, social activist, abolitionist, and leading figure of the early women's rights movement. Her Declaration of Sentiments presented at Seneca Falls, the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848, is often credited with initiating the first organized women's rights and women's suffrage movements in the United States. Stanton was president of the National Women's Suffrage Association from 1892 until 1900. And now I'm just going to read you a quote from the Winnebago County Press, November 26, 1870. The Good Templars asked suffrage activist Elizabeth Cady Stanton to come to town, and that town was Nina, to fill one of their lecture course series dates in 1870. She spoke before a large audience at Pettibone Hall. So kind of interesting. On the right is Susan Brownell Anthony, better known as Susan B. Anthony. She was born in 1820 and died in 1906. She was an American social reformer and women's rights activist who played a pivotal role in the women's suffrage movement. She was born into a Quaker family committed to social equality, and she collected anti-slavery petitions at the young age of 17. In 1856, she became the New York State agent for the American Anti-Slavery Society. Here's another quote from the Nina Daily Times, November 17, 1886. A good audience listened to Susan B. Anthony in Schutzen Hall last evening. This was located on South Commercial Street. She stated that when any class is disenfranchised, whether white, black, male, or female, there resulted not only political, but moral, industrial, and nearly every other kind of degradation. So, kind of interesting. This is a picture of Susan B. Anthony's home in Rochester, New York, um, where I was, I was just there for my nephew's wedding, so I took a picture and visited her home, and that is her parlor on the right. Um, inside that parlor, she was arrested for voting in the November 5th, 1872 presidential election. Imagine being arrested for voting. <laughs> And this is in the park that is adjacent to her home. There's a statue of Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass, who was a very close friend of hers. Kathy made me put this slide in. You have to look at the research you've done. Yes, I travel to the ends of the earth. Another famous uh, social reformer was Jane Addams, born in 1860, passed away in 1935. Jane Addams was one of the most influential progressive reformers in the country. She was a social worker, philosopher, and leader of the women's suffrage movement and peace movement. Her ideas on practical reform for the betterment of family, local communities, and the nation were very influential, and she is considered the founder of the American social work movement. In 1931, she was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for her work on internationalism and peace. So what do Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and Jane Addams all have in common? They were all champions for women's right to vote. They were all focused on the betterment of women and families. 
and they all visited Nina and Manisha. Oh. And they all lived over 47 years. <laughs> um, this is a letter that was written by our own Theda Clark. Um, she recruited um, Jane Adams to come to Nina to speak. And I'll just read it to you, January 15th, 1900. Dear Billy, she was writing to her fiance. Yes, indeed, our day with Miss Adams was one not soon to be forgotten. I felt that I had breathed a breath of true nobility. She is so plain, so simple, unassuming. I had five ladies in to lunch to meet her, and all recalled, although she was very retiring and modest, she did talk of her travels, her work, and great things in general. Her English was so pure, she used good, round, mouth-filling Saxon words that expressed much and revealed the pleasant, uplifting channels along which her busy mind travels. Between 30 and 40 ladies and some gentlemen gathered at the Menasha Library to hear her, and it fell to your humble servant to introduce Miss Adams. I was sorry that I could not do it gracefully. I entertained the lady until she departed at 540, and as you may imagine, I walked in the clouds. <laughs> So the Menasha Library is where her presentation was held. The Nina Library was not built until 1904, um, after the death of Theda Clark in 1903, but on land that was donated to the city by Theda Clark. It's not surprising that Theda Clark had uh, an interest in the women's suffrage movement, considering her father's background and influence on her. As, I included this quote from one of the letters that C.B. Clark wrote to his daughter, Theda, which I thought just really captures what he was trying to instill in her. Theda, the best happiness we get in this world is in making someone other than ourselves most happy. But he was uh, very well known as a women's suffrage promoter and um, encourager. And probably more so than anyone else um, in Nina in the early years. He was a member of the Nina Lyceum and the Good Templars organization. And in 1885, the Wisconsin Woman Suffrage Directory named C.B. Clark a friend to the cause. Also in 1885, Clark was elected to the state legislature. While performing this duty, he presented to the assembly Petition 371 it pleaded for the passage of a memorial to Congress for the 16th Amendment granting women suffrage. And it was signed by many from Nina, Winnebago County. The state legislature that year came very close to amending the state constitution and allowing women the right to vote. The resolution required a majority of 100 assemblymen to vote in the affirmative in order to pass. The vote stood at 47 ayes, 42 noes, and 11 not voting. Just four votes short, Clark, of course, voted aye. Had this resolution successfully passed in both houses, Wisconsin would have been the first state to allow women to vote in 1885. So this is kind of a, a thought to consider. I think it's sometimes true, not always true, but it's certainly true for these three instances. Uh, and that idea is the radical ideas of one generation become the common sense of the next. And some of the ideas that were considered very radical in 1900 were the idea that women should have the right to vote, that we should limit the hours that children work, and that social problems could be addressed with better education. I think it's pretty clear that those are ideas are now common sense. So what did we look like moving back now and down into our local community? What did we look like during the Progressive Era? Um, in 1885, Nina had electric street lights, um, and homes were soon to follow after that. This was four years before the White House and the streets of Washington, D.C. were lit by electricity. So pretty amazing for Nina. Here's some other just interesting snippets of Nina history for turn of the century. In 1898, Charles Bergstrom converted his blacksmith shop and carriage business to selling bicycles. 
His shop later became the first automobile dealership in Nina in 1905. In 1900, the National Manufacturer's Bank reported deposits of $474,418.63. In 1901, the Nina Auditorium Company formed to build the Nina Theater. Also in 1901, Menasha Woodenware was the largest pail manufacturer in the world. In 1903, Theda Clark Peters died shortly after childbirth in her home. A new school, the Kimberly High School, was built in 1906. In 1908, the Wisconsin Telephone Company built a substantial new building in Nina. So a lot was happening. It was an exciting time. Here's a picture of downtown Menasha at the same time. I don't know. Okay, Kathy will tell you about that. Uh, on the photo, I would just like to point out that the left-hand side of the street called excuse me, Lower Main Street has almost all the buildings still standing where the aw uh, awnings begin. Uh, a store down is the Weather Vane Restaurant and you can see down toward the Fox River the very end of that block would be where Club Liquor is now. <laughs> the hotel on the right-hand side was before the actual Menasha Hotel was built. This one preceded it and was burned down, but we believe this photo was taken somewhere in the late 1890s. No paved streets and wooden sidewalks and the horse and carriages, and we do have a trolley coming down the street, but we just so enjoy these old photos, and they're so interesting to the people in our community. So that's why we included this one. Thanks, Kathy. So now you have a sense of what was going on in the national scene, what we looked like in the state, what we looked like locally. So let's talk now about some of those women who were living during this time period. And what did they accomplish in their lives here? So some of these women might be familiar to you. On the upper left, you can see Theda Clark. Her contributions to the community are so innumerable, we could probably do an entire program just on her life, and we probably should. Next is Helen Kimberly Stewart, Clara Bloom, Gertrude Sensenbrenner Bergstrom, on the bottom left is Ida Heinecke. She was the first nurse for the VNA. She originally um, had a horse that she used to go um, home to home doing her rounds with and helping people in the community with illnesses and childbirth. Uh, but her horse couldn't take the cold, so she just went on foot. Next is Ann Kelly Gilbert, then Clara Merriman Shattuck, Clara Merriman Shattuck was responsible for donating the land that is our current Shattuck Park and revitalizing that piece of property which had been a, a city dump prior to that. And Frances Hewitt Kimberly on the far right on the bottom. There are so many more women that we could talk about and so many more stories, but I'll just focus in on a few of these women who instead of saying someone ought to do something about it, but why should it be I, instead said somebody must do something about it, then why not I? So here is Helen Kimberly Stewart. She was born in 1869 and died in 1956. She was the oldest daughter of John Alfred Kimberly, who was one of the four founders of Kimberly and Clark. One of the things that she is known for, aside from many other accomplishments, is that she went toe-to-toe -to -toe with a very prominent local businessman. He wanted to build his home at what is now Kimberly Point, and he wanted Lakeshore Drive to become a private drive. And she did not want to see that happen, so she, it was a pretty bold move on her part. She went toe-to-toe -to -toe with this very prominent man and purchased up land around that area and donated it to the city and essentially kept Lakeshore Drive open 
so that we can still all enjoy that today. I think I personally feel like I owe her a debt of gratitude because I just love the point. She also served as the first woman alderman in Nina, and that was in 1930. And she was the first woman to run for mayor. She organized the first League of Women Voters in Nina and ended up being the Wisconsin president for the League of Women Voters in the 20s, so very shortly after women achieved the right to vote. She worked for the American Red Cross throughout her life, and she also served on Nina's school board. So quite an amazing woman. Clara Bloom, born in 1878, died in 1947. She graduated from Menasha High and then went to Ripon College. That in itself, I think, is an accomplishment for a woman at that time period to have gone to college and graduated. She worked at the Daily, uh, Nina Daily News, where her father was the editor. She became the editor of the newspaper when her father died, and then when the Nina Daily News merged with the News Times, she became the editor of that combined newspaper in 1919. I think it's amazing to think about her being the editor of the newspaper for us locally when women didn't yet have the right to vote. So she had a huge influence on what people were seeing, reading, hearing about, and the news that we were all receiving as a community. It's interesting to see, um, this is a page out of the program for the Women's Tuesday Club of Nina. And their yearbooks are available for each year. This was the 1906 yearbook, and you can see Miss Bloom was number three on the program, talking about living and getting a living, income and maintenance, and food and morals. I just think it would be so fun to be able to go back in time and listen to what they were talking about. But really interesting that she was, um, Concerned about living and getting a living. She was a single woman. Gertrude Sensenbrenner Bergstrom, born in 1887, died in 1973. She was the president of the USO for the state of Wisconsin during World War II. Quite an accomplishment and a lot of work. She worked tirelessly for the American Red Cross, establishing um, a room in her home to serve as the Red Cross uh, work station. She served as the only woman on the St. Norbert's College Board of Governors. She served as chairman of the advisory board for St. Elizabeth Hospital. And she also served on the foundation board for the University of Wisconsin. Ann Kelly Gilbert. She was born in 1868 and died in 1944. She was born in Mississippi and met her husband there. They ended up moving up to Nina. She graduated from Notre Dame College of Maryland. She was a founder and the very first president of the Visiting Nurse Association of Nina. And you have to understand a little bit more about her story to understand why that's significant. Her husband moved up to Nina. Um, they, uh, he had accepted a job or the role in Gilbert Paper Company with his brothers, but they had only lived here for three years and he died of a heart attack in his sleep. Um, he built the house that is at 1010 East Forest Avenue. Um, it's still there today, but they had five children. So here she was left a widow out of her comfort zone, which was probably Mississippi where her parents were and living in this community. And instead of you know, throwing in the towel, she became the founder and first president of the VNA. Well, eventually, after um, being very involved and committed to the community, she decided to move her children to Washington, D.C., where she became a very well-known and widely published poet and author. She was also president of the Women's Tuesday Club in 1908 while she was still living in Nina. Frances Hewitt Kimberly, um, 1851 to 1926. Again, this is a story of a woman um, facing the hardship of losing her husband. Her husband had been injured in a train accident and paralyzed. 
He later died from back surgery, which was performed in his home. Um, they had four children. Her husband had been active in the Bank of Menasha and also the Bank of Nina, and her father had played a prominent role in those organizations. But I think it's very interesting that she became the vice president of the Bank of Menasha in 1894, and she served on the board of directors for the National Bank of Nina from 1893 to 1895. When you think of a woman doing that and assuming that important role when they didn't have the right to vote yet, it's kind of interesting and puts it in perspective. I think it's also nice that her obituary stated, hers was a refreshing, cheery spirit, a strong and faithful character. So now I'm going to turn it over to Kathy, and we're going to learn a little bit about some of the women from Menasha. Thank you, Jane. You just have to show me where to change the slide. Right there. Okay. All right. So for the Menasha portion of this program, I thought I'd address what life was like back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And as we started researching the women of the time that were prominent and um, some of the incredible things they did, I got to thinking about how difficult at those times to live when there were no modern conveniences. Several of these ladies lost children because of disease, scarlet fever, smallpox, influenza. If not for Theta Clark, Theta Clark, I'm not sure when the area would have had a hospital. But they had very difficult beginnings in this community, was, which was just being founded. In fact, I, should, I have to start with Elisha D. Smith and his wife Julia, and Julia is not represented here. It seems like a lot of people know about the Smith story, um, but one thing they might not know is that Elisha Smith married Julia Mori on the East Coast, and the day after their wedding, they began a journey to Wisconsin, and it took them eight days to get here. There was some railroad at the beginning, then they had to change to steamship, and then at one point, a stagecoach. And then at the very end of their journey, uh, sailboats coming into Nina and Menasha. She had no idea where she was coming to. And her father on the East Coast begged her not to come. She was the only child, and he was so hesitant that she would come to the unknown, to the wilderness of Wisconsin. Um, in any event, um, I just wanted to state that as I discussed these women and, and the era and how difficult their life was, I think about what we have now. Um, they had no Alexa, they had no Siri, and I think that they would be absolutely amazed to know that these kinds of things are here now in this electronic age we live in. So the first woman I would like to speak about uh, is Jean Pond Minor Coburn. And Jean's picture is the large one on the right hand side. And she sculpted a seven foot tall statue that is on the grounds of our capital in Madison and I will tell you how that came about. I just want to introduce you to the other ladies up in the upper left-hand corner is Lucy Lee Pleasance. She helped start the first library in Menasha. Next to her is Hypatia Boyd Reed. She was married to the son of Curtis Reed. Underneath the lovely older lady is Melissa Handler who married John Grove. And on the far left is Ida Clovis Grove, her daughter. <laughs> and one other thing I'd like to mention as I go into the stories, I'd like to have you take a look at the beautiful artwork over on the left-hand side on the tables and the easels. 
and I'm going to tell you how that came to be as soon as I finish the stories of the ladies. Okay. Jane, you're going to have to tell me again which one to. Thank you. That one right there. Okay. So, Jean Pond Minor Colburn, born in 1865, and as you can see, lived 101 years to 1967. She was born here in Menasha and wanted to be an artist. And her family was not very pleased about that, but she knew she had talent and she decided to go ahead. She went to art school. She was selected when she was 28 years old as an artist in residence at the Chicago World's Fair, which must have been a thrill for her. So she sculpted the seven foot statue that she named Forward, which was obviously a rare honor for the woman in the 1890s. And she continued to paint until she died at age 101. And she went to painting because arthritis was affecting her fingers and she could no longer sculpt. Um, she did earn a master's degree at the Art Institute of Chicago and she later taught there. She was a protege of Laredo Taft and she said that her statue forward represented what she felt were two Wisconsin qualities, devotion and progress. She also created many lovely works of art including this beautiful stained glass window, which is in the church on the corner of Broad and Milwaukee Street. At first it was the Congregational Church in Menasha, and it became, I believe, the Evangel Deaf Chapel, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not sure um, what is in that building right now, but um, we also have some reliefs that she uh, made, I think they're called bass reliefs, if I'm saying that correctly. We have them at the Historical Society. But obviously, we're very proud of Jean's efforts and the fact that she felt strong enough to go after a career that she wanted. And let me see here. You'll have to bear with me, because I haven't done this before. So. Um, this lovely lady, Melissa Handler Clovis, lived from 1852 to 1940. Interestingly, she opened Menasha's only dry goods store. She borrowed money from Alicia D. Smith's family. She bought a store. She rented half of it out to the federal government, so half of her store became the post office in Menasha. She and her husband, John, started the Clovis Stock Farm and owned a lot of land in Menasha. The more successful they became, the more land they bought. Uh, her husband passed away in 1910, and Melissa ran the farm and the store after her husband's death. And as our research showed, at the time of her death, she did own much of downtown Menasha. She unfortunately had four children, and I say unfortunately because the two of her little boys died in infancy, and one suffered a severe head injury in a horse and carriage accident and never recovered from that. Then she had a daughter, Ida Clovis. She, Ida graduated in Menasha High School in 1889, and Ida married a gentleman by the name of Frank Grove. Frank and some partners started Grove Manufacturing in Oshkosh, and they came up with a line of clothing entitled Oshkosh Bagash, which I never knew until I started researching the story of the Grove family. They also had Grove clothing in Menasha. A very interesting part of this story, as this family became quite successful, is that Ida and Frank's son, Alva, inherited all the land in Menasha 
north of 9th Street uh, to the edge of the city. And Alva, when he inherited the land from his grandparents, Melissa and John, decided to donate that land to the city of Menasha. And on that land is the Clovis Grove Elementary School. And another interesting fact is, if you are in that neighborhood, the familiar street names are Ida, Melissa, John, Grove, Alva, Clovis, Arthur. So they pretty much covered the whole family. So we thought that was an interesting story. This photo I chose, this is a lovely home. It's no longer there on Broad Street in Menasha. And the Clovises and Groves had been become very su successful in their farm and in their business. And this is the home where Ida and Frank got married. And apparently they had one of the biggest parties Menasha had ever seen. Um, they had, on the inside of their home, um, it's described as a grand affair with flowers decorating their home, an orchestra in the upper hall, supper was served, there was dancing in the pavilion on the lawn, the grounds were lit by hundreds of Chinese lanterns, and apparently hundreds of guests attended that wedding, which I thought was um, quite unique for Menasha in that time period. This picture, however, is a different view. We're going back to the farm where Melissa and John raised cattle. And I was so struck by this because obviously the ladies, just like our lovely young ladies that we have here tonight as hostesses, were all wearing long dresses. There was no such thing as a woman wearing casual and wearing slacks. And I just can't even imagine what it must have been like to farm and dress like that. Um, pretty amazing. And of course, in addition, the women had, they were caring for their families, they were cooking, they were cleaning. The electronic age wasn't upon us, so how they did all this without washing machines and dryers and other modern conveniences is just kind of hard to realize. All right, the next lady I'd like to mention, and I think it's Hypatia. There's no one here to tell us anymore how to pronounce that name, and I haven't heard it since. Hypatia. Hypatia Boyd married the son of Curtis Reed. His name was Charles. Hypatia lost her hearing when she was six years old during a scarlet fever epidemic. And unfortunately, uh, that same epidemic uh, took the lives of her two sisters. They died of scarlet fever. From the scarlet fever, Hypatia became deaf, and her parents, who were originally from Scotland, traveled there and to other cities in the United States to try to find a miracle cure for that deafness. This was such a difficult time period. And again, I mentioned diphtheria, pneumonia, typhoid, cholera, and then no hospital here, and very few doctors. Thank you, Jane, for that adjustment. OK, so Hypatia, when she went to school, she uh, actually uh, went to school and was sponsored by Alexander Graham Bell, oh my and also the wife of the university president. So she was the first deaf student who was accepted by the University of Wisconsin, and that was in 1895. Uh, sub so she learned oral communication since she had had hearing until she was six years old. She continued the use of oral communication and lip reading instead of signing. And after she married, came back to Menasha and married Charles Reed, who was profoundly deaf, Charles used sign language, and Alexander Graham Bell 
and others thought that she took a step backward because she could read and she could attend normal school. She, although felt like she was more comfortable in the deaf community, and her life became pivotal in the deaf movement. In a way, she was a bridge between the signing community and the people who used oral language and lip reading in that area. She was actually embraced by both the deaf community and those outside of it, and did an incredible amount of good here helping the deaf community. This photo happens to be of downtown Menasha looking the other way. This is Upper Main Street. We have no particular time period here, but on the far right, the very tall tower was our beautiful fire station. It was the fire station, it was jail, and it was also city hall. And the horses were boarded on the side of the city hall. And you can see all the workers and the incredibly hard work done without modern machinery. I, I just, I can't even imagine how difficult it must have been in that era to do projects like this and build up the city. And I'm sorry this is kind of scratchy. I, I'm not used to speaking in this mic, so I hope it's not too annoying for you. In any event, that was life in early Menasha. And on the far left, you'll see a sign, hopefully, that says George Bonta. That was the first office and publishing company of George Bonta, whose wife basically kicked him out of the garage at home. And first he started printing in the dining room, then he got moved to the garage, and then she said, no, you, you, you need to have a store. So I believe there's a Western Union Telegraph office, and as you can see, the power poles, and uh, our progressive community really starting to grow. Now, I'm going to talk about Lucy Lee Pleasance. I love this story. Lucy Lee moved here to Menasha in 1877 because her family was negatively impacted by the Civil War. Basically, they lost everything. Her family, the Pleasance family, came here from the East Coast. And let me see. I don't know what that noise is. There. There's the Pleasance family. Um, the family all were great readers. I'm sure it was culture shock for them to move here to Menasha, but they did have land on Doty Island, and when they lost everything, um, they moved here, and this is on Namit Street in Menasha. And there were five girls and two boys in the family. And their mother, Sally, was had her debut at a ball given by Dolly Madison. So she had quite an affluent background. In the family, uh, her, uh, Lucy Lee's sister, Ellen, married a fellow by the name of George Bonta. And I think she did pretty good with that marriage. But their mother said she did not want any of her daughters to marry any of these doggone Yankees. She said, you wait until fine southern gentlemen, and then you get married. So only Ellen got married. Lucy Lee had this love of books and decided that she wanted to open or help begin a library. So her story is she called a meeting of people in Nina and Menasha and she said, if you're interested, come to the National Hotel and we'll see how we can begin to form a library. And they were interested, 40 or 50 people came. They ended up in the, on the second floor of what we call the Tuxer Building in Menasha. And Elisha D. Smith, a 
without wind of that effort and said that he could help uh, monetarily and he gave a contribution of $25,000 to start the library which was opened in, in 1898 and many of you may remember that beautiful library on Mill Street in Menasha. Um, Lucy Lee actually ended up being the head librarian. She worked for $50 a year, and she worked there for 23 years. When you go into the library, you'll find her beautiful portrait on the wall of the children's department and um, the children's department in the original library and our current library were dedicated to the memory of Lucy Lee Pleasance. One thing that she did along with Elisha Smith, and I thought this was incredible, she made sure that the library had books in German and in Polish to welcome the immigrants because so many people were coming here to take jobs in the factories. And both Mr. Smith and especially Miss Pleasance wanted them to feel at home and assimilate quickly and know that they were welcome. So, um, let's see, I think she did so much as far as the library and we owe her a debt of gratitude, her love of books, and her willingness to share with the community. This photo, I'm sort of winding up here, but this photo was taken with today's technology by our art director, our president of our society, uh, Nick Jevney in the back. Uh, we have had school groups come to the Memorial Building, that's our home, and after we showed them the treasures that we have in the society, uh, Nick showed them how a drone works. <laughs> and they were absolutely fascinated by that. As you, they're looking up like, oh my goodness, this is so cool, so incredible. Um, I show this because both Nina Historical Society and Menasha feel that it's very important that we pass along these stories and these artifacts to our young people so that they know our community, what happened, who made a difference. And so our uh, historical society invites third graders every year to come and tour the museum and we tell them stories. And they love to come. Unbelievably, we have a few kids who don't know what a typewriter is. They see it, you know, they have, they have no clue what you're supposed to do with that. Um, and many other things. Um, so, let's see. Um, I told you that I was going to speak about those beautiful works of art. And the reason is, that we were contacted by a Menasha High School teacher, Erin Culligan, and Erin is here in our group tonight. Erin, will you just wave? Okay, I think this is such a great thing. Erin decided that she wanted her students not only to do art pieces, but to do the art pieces with places and people from Menasha. And I think that you would agree that these works of art are beautiful. They've done an amazing job. Um, on the far left there is the home of Mr. and Mrs. Smith, Elisha and Juliet Smith. And there are a few of Ellen Bonta. There is one of Captain Richard Hill uh, from, and the company E-Room at um, National Library is dedicated to him. In any event, I just want to thank Erin and teachers like her who want to integrate history and art and help our students get a better look at our past. I think that's just amazing. And when I got a recent email from Erin as we've been talking back and forth about this program, she had
has a quote at the bottom of her email, and that quote is, be the change you wish to see in the world. Mm -hmm. And that's a quote by Gandhi, but I think, Erin, this just fits in so well with our program and with what we're trying to do. Um, actually, Jean, I think if you want to finish up here. All righty. I think I have all my slides. So again, why do these stories matter? These stories matter because the women and men in many cases who championed uh, these causes positively impacted what we're still enjoying today. The VNA, which started in 1908 by women of Nina, was on the leading edge of public health nursing. The Nina Menasha Emergencies started, Emergency Society started in 1906 in response to the San Francisco earthquake. It's still going strong today. The YMCA, originally a girls club, started by the Tuesday Club, later became the YWCA, then the YMCA, also still going strong. Mm -hmm. The Brigade started in 1900 to grow character in young men of Nina. J.E. Chapin, um, pastor at the Presbyterian Church of Nina, was the founder of that organization in Nina, but I'm thinking his wife Harriet probably had a lot of say in that as well. <laughs> the many parks of Nina and Menasha Shattuck Park, Kimberly Point, Washington Park, um, many in Menasha. The Women's Tuesday Club, which started in 1885, by women who believed in educating themselves and making a difference. The libraries of both Nina and Menasha. The League of Women Voters, it's, it was active then in Nina, still active now. So we hope that you will be inspired to keep making Nina and Menasha great hometowns, just as the women of our progressive era did. And please remember to keep the why not I attitude. Thank you for all you do as the people of Nina and Menasha to make our communities and hometowns great. And we hope that you'll consider the ways that you will be difference makers in your own lives and in your own time. Thank you. One more thing to say. Shamelessly, we have uh, Wisconsin Hometown Stories, Nina Menasha, at the table with the lovely young ladies. Uh, they are for sale for $10. Uh, Jane and I both had little cameo appearances, and we were waiting for Hollywood to call, but they never did. So here we are. Um, and the other thing is, our focus this year is going to be on the Grin Theater because so many people um, have, have been there and have stories about the Bryn Theater. We're going to have some sessions where we're going to invite people to come and tell their stories. But tonight, we have a notebook and a pen. So if you know you want to share something, please just leave your name and your phone number and we will call you because we are getting some really interesting stories. We plan to prepare a booklet and all of you can be part of history if you have a Bryn story to tell. So thank you for that. I don't know. Nick, can you help? We have one video that we wanted to show at the end. This is kind of like the icing on the cake. And I have to commend Nick. We were given as a gift 92 8 millimeter films from uh, the communities around us and they were given to us by Greg Lesher whose parents and grandparents uh, lived in Menasha and were great successes. He came and he said, would you like these 92 8 millimeter films? And we said, absolutely. And one of the first things that Nick found as he is processing the 8 millimeter film and turning into digital is <laughs> if we can help you, we hope. <laughs> We're clicking on the tab. Click on the icon. I did. I did. I'll try it on. Okay. Open, open. You can do it. Okay, oh, there, there it is. is. 
Another person who came to Nina was the lovely Amelia Earhart. And this was in 1935, I believe two years before her disappearance. But here she comes, on the train into the depot. With the long fur coat. With a long fur coat. You see her right there? And I think Jane has a, a family involvement in that, don't you? When Amelia came? Uh, yeah. Um, and actually, I was thinking about the fact that a good friend of the society, Betty Hill, I don't think she's here tonight, but I remember her telling me the story of when she met Amelia Earhart at the train and how she was just patting her fur coat. <laughs> <laughs> so then when I saw the video, there she, there's the fur coat. <laughs> But um, I had, my mom had always said I had tea with Amelia Earhart, and I thought, that's ridiculous, and I don't know it. But it actually was true, and I found a ticket to the event where Amelia Earhart was speaking at the armory. And so I also had a diary of my mom's where she wrote in every single day. So it was, I believe it was February 11th, the date was on the beginning, um, of 1935. And February 11th. February 11th. So I looked in my mom's diary, February 11th, 1935, and it said, went to school, came home, played, met Amelia Earhart. <laughs> <laughs> but um, she met her and had tea with her when she was uh, a young girl, and she was very inspired by that and always told that story as one of the most remarkable experiences of her life. So. Anyway, just good to remember that. And also a good reminder to sign up to come to the Oral History Collection uh, workshop. So thank you for coming tonight. Okay.